me, and one bitter man is Frank Gaffney, a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, president of the uh, Center for Security Policy, www.securefreedom.org, and, of course, the host of the widely listened to uh, show, Secure Freedom, every night in the Washington, D.C. area on AM 1260, immediately following my show. Uh, Frank, are you recovered from the uh, emotional blow of knowing that the Cleveland uh, convention will be not open to Steelers fans? (laughs) <laughs> you know, I hadn't heard that, Hugh. I, I think uh, the, this is a big tent party, isn't it? So I'm sure that they're going to have a few Steeler fans there. No, there's a there's a little flap in the back that Santorum's going to be allowed to enter through because he's also a Steeler fan. Okay, Frank, let's get serious. Um, this looks like Netanyahu, they, they, the Jerusalem Post announcing they have done in 48 hours more than they did during the entire conflict in 2012. They hit 500 targets in 30 minutes. This looks like Hamas is on the ropes. Well, it's interesting, Hugh. I think Hamas may have been on the ropes before all this began, and that, in fact, may be why Hamas has done what it's done that's precipitated uh, quite properly, I think, this kind of uh, retaliation by the Israelis. I I think with the overthrow of Morsi, uh, Mohammed Morsi in Egypt, uh, who had been, of course, greatly enabling the Palestinian franchise of the Muslim Brotherhood, namely Hamas, uh, opening, you know, uh, crossings and more tunnels and all the rest. Um, when he went down and a government replaced him that wanted no part of the Muslim Brotherhood, in fact, considered it properly a terrorist organization and started blowing up those tunnels and shutting down those crossings, um, it greatly constricted the flow of cash and uh, other goods, arms, and so on that the folks in Gaza had been receiving. About the same time, they were kind of on the outs with uh, their other principal sponsor, namely the Iranians. Uh, because they were having fights over uh, Assad in Syria. Uh, But the point is, Hugh, that I think whatever prompted Hamas to take this rash action, and I think it was desperation, maybe it was the Iranians telling them to do it to to distract the Israelis, I don't know. But whatever it was, they created conditions under which Netanyahu had to act. And I'm glad he's acted decisively. Um, I hope that, in fact, what he has accomplished in those 500 uh, strikes uh, will irreparably harm Hamas. Um, But I wouldn't count on it, quite honestly. And um, it's likely to be a long, hard slog. Now, Frank, uh, during an earlier segment, a caller from Atlanta said, now, how in the world did they get these M302 rockets when Israel intercepted the ship from Iran last year? I speculated, it's just pure speculation, you're the expert on the Middle East, that during that Morsi period, the doors were wide open and Hamas stocked every shelf it could with every explosive it could get its hands on and that, therefore, the arsenal facing the IDF is significantly more dangerous than that which they faced in 2012. What do you think? I think that's probably right, Joe. I don't know that we can be certain about it, but uh, assuming that the Israeli naval blockade uh, precluded anything of uh, the size that would be required to get those kinds of weapons in, they had to have come uh, underground. And indeed, I think that the Morsi government, as I said, was uh, all about helping build up Hamas. Uh, And the Israelis, I think, have been surprised at how much of this stuff, with the longer and longer ranges capable of hitting much of Israel now, um, is uh, actually in the hands of Hamas. We've known for some time that they're in the hands of Hezbollah to the north. Unfortunately, they haven't been heard from yet at at the moment. But um, there's a, you know, by some estimates, 100,000 rockets and missiles aimed at Israel uh, at the moment. And uh, if the Israelis have taken down some number of them in Hamas stand, that's a good thing. But that doesn't uh, allay the concerns about some of the other axes from which those missiles could be launched. I also had a caller who said to me, and I want to see if this is confirmable, he's got two sons or two children, he said, in Israel right now. And so he's deeply worried about missiles hitting Tel Aviv. And I assured him Iron Dome seems to be working pretty darn good, but, but nevertheless, you would be worried. 
He made the assertion that the first government in the world to recognize the new Israeli Hamas coalition as an official government was ours. I, I didn't understand that to be the case, but am I wrong, Frank? I think it's worse than that, Hugh. Uh, I think under Martin Indyk, the president's uh, special envoy for the so-called peace process under John Kerry, uh, the U.S. government was very actively involved in helping set up this government. In fact, I was told today that uh, they were calibrating very, very carefully how much of a Hamas participation they thought they could get away with. Uh, and they, of course, adopted the line that, well, these are just technocrats, and they've even now gone so far as to say, well, the, the four Hamas people aren't actually associated with Hamas. But the truth of the matter is, uh, whether we were literally the first government to recognize this so-called unity government or, or not, I don't know, Hugh, but I think there's no question that the United States government under Barack Obama was intimately involved in creating this unity government, and that obviously makes it even worse. Well, it's remarkable to me, and, and if you can stay during the break, I want to talk to you about this, that, that Americans don't seem to get what it means to have hundreds of rockets thrown at your densest population center. No Israelis have been killed, thank God. I'm sorry that innocent Palestinians are being killed, as I know you are as well. But no government can put up with this, Frank. It just, it's just, it's, it's, they can't they can't allow it to happen and your job is to remind people of that and that's why the center for security policy matters so much but it seems to me almost assumed by the most much of the manhattan beltway media that this is normal ordinary business yeah you know i was just told that there's an app that you can put on your phone called red zone and it tells you when a missile or rocket has been fired at a target in Israel, and one of my colleagues has it on his phone, and he said it's been going off all day. And Red Zone. I'll look during the break for that. Can you stick with me, Frank, through the break? Sure. Good. I'll be right back with Frank Gaffney, Steelers fan, but otherwise a good man, the leader of Center for Security Policy, which you ought to be supporting if you're not already. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Thanks so much for listening. Frank Gaffney is my guest. Frank, I wanted to run past you something that Lee Smith, a noted Arabologist, uh, said on the program yesterday. He said, look, we've got two choices in this ever-expanding war. Obviously, it's not a choice to stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, but, but whether or not we would align ourselves with the... Uh, Iranian access or whether or not we would align ourselves with the Sunni access and his view is the analogy is the Sunnis are Russia and the Shias are the Nazis in this case we have to concentrate on our biggest foe which is Iran and treat Isis as uh, not yet a state not yet as dangerous what do you think of that Jack this is a uh... Uh, Jack, <laughs> Q. Q. Excuse me. I'm, I'm uh, thinking of Jack because I'm sitting in his office and he sends oh. his regards to you, as a matter of fact. Oh, good. Uh, Mine back to I'm, him. I'm just, I'm of the view that uh, this is the devil in the deep blue sea. Uh, we clearly are dealing in Iran with a nation that is uh, shortly, and anybody's guess how soon, but shortly to become not only the world's greatest terrorist nation, but also a nuclear-armed one, uh, with immense resources and uh, now basically given a free pass to use those resources to become uh, an even more deadly threat, not just to Israel, not just to other parts of the world, but to us. At the same time, we're witnessing the emergence of uh, a new terrorist nation, uh, also with very substantial resources, uh, with an army, um, not huge but growing by the day, uh, that is now marketing itself as the caliphate uh, under the Sunni leadership of uh, this fellow al-Baghdadi. I believe that both of these are mortal enemies of America for the simple reason that they share the basic ideology of Sharia. 
And I think to either pick one over the other or to partner with one over the other uh, against the other uh, would be a, a, a fatal mistake. They are both enemies of this country. And while they disagree with one another and they will kill each other, uh, hopefully in great numbers, um, not their people, ideally, but, but uh, their combatants, uh, this, is, uh, this is a case of I don't believe either of them being people that we can safely do business with. Uh, I, I agree, but nevertheless, you have to make choices if you fight, if you give the Iraqi Republic arms to fight ISIS, you are in effect, are you not helping Iran? You are. You are. If you, if you go into aerial operations against ISIS, you are helping Iran as well. I think it's well, a uh, very more on that. mistake. Great. More on that next week. Uh, Frank Gaffney, thank you. I'll be right back. America Daniel Silva joins me in hour two of the Hugh Hewitt Show.